Welcome to One Plus One. I'm Rosie Batty. Frances Rings is a storyteller. She uses dance to teach audiences about her country, her people, and her culture. Frances is about to take the reins here at Bangara, Australia's leading Indigenous dance company. Today, she'll tell us her story. Yellow, women's business, ceremonial, nurturing, creation of life. Francis Rings, welcome to One Plus One. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks for having me. You've recently been appointed as Artistic Director of the Bangara Dance Theatre. Tell me about Bangara. Why is it so important? Well, Bangara is a Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander dance company. And, you know, we tell stories from Indigenous Australia uh, that speak of our history, of our contemporary life, of the social issues of our vibrant cultures and I guess give insight into who we are, the black experience and um, our survival and who we are today. We have been doing our thing for 32 years now. You know, when we started, it was just a small company that went out and did school shows that worked with community, it was travelled around to regional and remote areas. <laughs> Stephen Page has been our director for the past 30 years and he's an incredible Mananjali man. You're inheriting the legacy of Stephen Page. How do you pay tribute to him but also create and make your own role? Okay, so if I think about stepping into, into Stephen's shoes and I think about everything that he's done and the amount of respect that he has in the industry, I'm completely intimidated and I'll just fall on the ground in the fetal position. <laughs> just want to stay there. But if I think about our relationship and what we have done together and how he trusts me, and the work that I've put into being where I am today, the sacrifices that I've made, the experiences, the relationships that I've built. And if I think about him passing me the smoking coolerman and asking me to take care of that and him trusting me with that, I'm fine. I know what I'm doing and I'm ready to go. I'm ready to take off. So I have to contextualise it and I have to put it in a way that, you know, this is our story, this is a Bangara story, and this is the way we do it. We did this as a clan and that's never gonna stop, you know. Did you always want to be a dancer, Francis? Um, and could you even imagine that you'd be here doing what you're doing now? Look, I didn't even know that this could be a career, that dance, that performing arts existed as a career, as a choice that you could make, um, that you could train in it. As a child, we didn't have much. Children don't know poverty as a word. They don't know, oh, I'm a poor child, I don't have much. Because you, you haven't been conditioned to think um, about what wealth and, you know, accumulating things and, and status and that kind of thing. We were just happy that, you know, I had my brothers and sisters we lived in this little town of Port Augusta 
and we had a lot more than some of the other mob that, you know, lived in town had. So when I look back at it now, I'm like, oh God, you know, we did it pretty tough. But I found that dance has always been a companion of mine, that it was somewhere I could go to. I can't remember ever not having it in my life. I was always daydreaming. I was always creating these worlds, these theatre productions, these worlds where I could kind of try to understand what was happening around me and my place in that world and how to better understand things. Just created these little theatre productions. I dressed my sisters up and they'd be like, oh God, here she goes again. <laughs> Your mother was a descendant of the Gugata tribe but you were mainly raised by your father, who was actually a German migrant. How was your relationship with him? So my father was very strict. He was, um, you know, he came out from Germany. He already had a family with him and... Um, he came out with a family? Yeah, yeah. Um, and he had uh, four children and they broke up him and his, um, his wife and he met my mum and, and they fell in love. And my younger years... We just travelled. It was very transient. You know, Dad worked on the railways um, where a lot of other migrant workers lived and worked and there were these camps up along the Trans-Australian Railway line from Port Augusta to Kalgoorlie. So, you know, uh, Dad and Mum travelled between those camps. Dad worked as a labourer. You were separated from your mother, your Aboriginal mother, at an early age. How did that happen? Ah... <sighs> It's a difficult thing to talk about why parents make the decisions that they do and the consequences of those decisions that have lifelong, you know, implications and effects on children. And, you know, I think for Dad, it was about protecting, um, protecting us. And yeah, it was, it was something, a decision that he made to uh, remove myself and my sister Gina and, you know, um, he wanted us to have opportunities. He wanted us to grow up in um, a town that had better resources, that had better schools. And I think much later on when I was a young woman, um, I had this sense of for me to go forward, I needed to know why he made that decision. And I think as a young woman, you don't always know how to go about asking the questions in the right way. And, you know, we had a bit of a fight and, you know, I asked him straight out. I said, why did you do that? Why did you take us away? Why did you not let us, let me see my mother? And, um, and he broke down and he cried and he apologised and... He said, I'm so sorry. I thought I was doing the right thing. I just wanted to protect you. I just wanted to look after you. And I think from that moment, I was able to find resolve and be able to let go of that and go, okay. And I felt like the tension all leave my body. And I was, I could, I can now, okay, it's, it's okay. We can go forward. I can have a relationship with you that is going to grow. And we've moved over this, this and we can, I can respect you in a different way now. So, yeah. And it seems that perhaps your mother didn't have a say? <sighs> Look, it's, the early 70s were yeah. a really difficult time. Yeah. The fear of welfare, the fear of removal, yeah. um, of growing up on a mission. And, you know, I think that there's, a lot of things that he didn't understand and that he was fearful of and I think that he also felt on the outer. Being a migrant, like I always thought it was hard being, you know, an Aboriginal woman and, you know, growing up in a, in a regional area and, you know, all of the prejudices and racisms and the, you know, the challenges that you face. But as a migrant and a German migrant, he faced challenges as well he and prejudices and you know and his relationship with 
Aboriginal people and with Indigenous people, you know, he was judged for that, for having Aboriginal children. You know, it was hard, hard years, hard to live and feel like you could be respected and be a parent and be a part of a community, you know. What happened with your younger sister, Gina? She was um, fostered to a family and, um, and it was a beautiful Aboriginal Nudinjuri family from South Australia and I met her foster mum and beautiful, strong woman, mother figure who cared for Gina and that was heartening for me. That, yeah. But I'm so conscious that when we experience these, uh, these uh, um, moments of trauma in our life when um, people have been removed like my sister was removed. And again, that was because it was like, oh, it's just temporary. It's just, you know, um, she's gonna, you know, she'll be back. And, um, and as a child, she was six, I think I was eight. And those feelings there, they sit underneath, they're, they're so, they're still fresh. And so I'm really mindful to kind of how I speak about this and how I kind of navigate this, respecting her and who she is today and her, her healing and our healing together. So they didn't tell you the truth at they the didn't, time? No. They no. were doing it yeah. to protect you yeah. or shield you? You know, you can't take back those years. You can't, you know, that's a big void for us. We're very much in each other's lives. And I'm so grateful that I have her. And was it dance that connected you we connected so, you with yeah, her. It was <laughs> when we found each other again, she was studying dance in Adelaide and I was studying dance in Sydney and, and she remembers the theatre shows that you used to yeah, do I think together. So. <laughs> she might have deliberately blocked them out actually. <laughs> She's probably scarred by them. <laughs> Bossy sister. You moved around a lot to different places with your dad. You spent time in Port Augusta, Kalgoorlie, Albany. What was it like moving around the country all the time? Not, you know, being able to put down roots or? It was difficult, yeah. I think the biggest, the most difficult part of that was going to new schools mm. and having to make new friends. And I always became consciously aware that we were different because we were these Aboriginal kids who had a German father and all the questions that people go like, you know, is that your father? And like, why, or is that, you know, why do you look different? And da, 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 and, and that was, I have, have to, to prepare through. myself, you know, to go through this cycle again and go, okay. And, you know, the seventies were awful for racism. And just remember kind of, you know, sitting in class and just wanting uh, to fall into a hole as they talked about Captain Cook and, you know, the um, just not feeling, just feeling shame and just feeling like I didn't have a place and, you know, I didn't quite fit in with the black fellas and I didn't quite fit in the white fellas. So I was just in this really weird gap of like, oh, I don't know. I'll just stay quiet. I'll just, you know, go back to my daydreaming and to my little creative space that's never let me down, you know. And, um, you learn coping mechanisms, survival mechanisms, adaptation. So living with your father who was German, what was your connection to culture growing up? Yeah, you know, he had a great respect for it. And, you know, he had many relationships with different mobs, you know. He loved my mother and I don't think he wanted to take me away from my culture. He wanted to protect me, but in, in protecting me, Unfortunately, you know, as a consequence, I was taken away. But we still had a lot of, you know, uh, family and stuff around us. And he remarried to a, a Noongar woman from, um, from Western Australia and she became my mother. And she was, you know, an incredible woman who just treated me as her own and, you know, and so strong and, you know, um, they had my three brothers and I kind of felt like I didn't have my own culture, but I had this, you know, and they embraced me and I, they never made me feel like I wasn't a part of, you know, their mob. So 
Yeah, I like to think that having a big family and a family that is maybe a patchwork of, you know, different cultures and different mobs and different backgrounds, it's allowed me to kind of just have this beautiful spectrum of experiences and respect for all of them, yeah. When did you realise that dancing was your life's purpose? My speech and drama teacher said, you know, there's this school in, uh, there's this um, college in, in Sydney. It's all Indigenous students and everything just dropped. I was like, OK, I need to go there. I need to find out where this place is. We need the application form. As soon as I did my last day of year 12, I was on a bus to Sydney. Um, at 17 and um, auditioning for NASDA Dance College. I remember my first day walking into the college and just seeing this incredible group of Indigenous young people from all around Australia. And they were confident and they were talking language and they were dynamic and vibrant and just like exhumed this pride, you know, so sexy and so like individual and happy in their own skin. And I was like, oh my God, I just want to be here. And, you know, I just want to be a part of this. You found Bangara in your early 20s and worked under artistic director Stephen Page. What did you learn from him and his brothers in those early years? They taught me so much. Stephen taught me how to be humble and how to have patience. And he was a visionary. He knew that he could be in the room, but he was always, you know, working strategically on the bigger picture and what we were doing next and setting up these different stages of, of the Bangar experience. I think Russell and I were always like these you know, we were always mucking around and just being silly and always, you know, lighten up the space. You know, Stephen would get very serious and we'd be the naughty kids in the corner. The other thing was David, of course. He had this great way of being able to play the dynamics between Russell and between Stephen and get things done, you know. Be able to go, when we tell our stories, let's do it with our voice, let's do it with our language. Sound as well as the, the warra. To go just, just, just to pull you in like, yeah. Yeah. Into that. Okay, yeah. 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 Into. Yeah. 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 Where it's gonna be. So it was always about very big dynamics in the room. I always start off kind of a little bit chaotic, but then it would circle around and come in and you'd just create this beautiful magic. You were a leading dancer with Bangara and other companies, and then you moved into choreography. Is that a natural progression? And what's the relationship between those two fields? It's, for some, it's a natural progression. And I think Stephen recognised that with me. And in this very space, you know, I can remember uh, when we did Brolga, you know, Stephen choreographed the, the Brolga duet with myself and with Russell. And he just spoke to us about story and then just allowed us to respond. And I think he could see that I was a maker and that I enjoyed being able to create. You've spent much of your career at Bangara and the company has been through some very painful times and with the loss of David and Russell. It must have been utterly devastating. Grief, for Indigenous people, grief is... It's a veil that we carry every day. Um, and in some ways, you don't want to lose that. I think, you know, part of what we do, part of honouring them is remembering them. Mm. It's having their presence alive in the space, in the music, how we respond. It's in the physicality of our young dancers that are coming through the next generation, that comes through as part of the Russell Page graduate program. We keep them alive. We keep them 
their, what they gave to us, that small little contribution, that precious time, those memories that we have. We honour David through the next generation of composers that are coming through, the David Page Music Fellow, um, in the scores and the stems of his music that, as, that can be a presence in our new productions and future productions. Um, you know, they both inspired a generation of young people, um, artists and creatives. They still do, you know. I'm just so grateful I had that time with them, that I saw those three and that I saw a work being created from the ground up and that I was a part of that process. And that's the greatest gift that I can take into the future, is to remember that, to honour that, and to ensure that that's protected. Bangara, its strength, it's a testament to the power of our stories, of our living language and culture and how that survived and all those stories that are out there that are still waiting to be told, you know. You've been appointed to the role of Artistic Director at Bangara. Have you known that for a while that it was going to happen? I know that that's something that I've always wanted, you know. To have an Indigenous woman in a position like this is rare. I think about what would me as a young person, and had I seen that at my age, had I seen somebody holding a space like that, just how valuable that is and just what that can do to inspire them, to be able to look to something, to someone, to Bangara, to Stephen or to myself and to be able to vision a future for themselves. The way I lead, it's about collaboration. It's about listening and hearing and respectfully responding and, you know, being patient and drawing on my skills as a mother and, you know, being inspired by women in leadership, by the hands that care for babies and, you know, mourn for our lo our, the ones that we've lost and, you know, cultivating the warrior spirit in our young people, you know. I think as a 52-year-old wom woman, um, I can trust that more now, not forcing things. Um, yeah, but, you know, knowing that this is right and we're ready. You're married and you've got two children. Yes. The thing is with my husband is that when I saw him and I, he was a stranger and I walked into a bar, I was with Stephen at the time, and I walked into a bar and I saw him and I said to Stephen, I'm going to marry that man and I'm going to have his children. And Stephen says, you're ridiculous. And, and I hadn't even had like, you know, hadn't had a gin and tonic yet, nothing. <laughs> I was totally sober. And, you know, sure enough, you know, I just felt like the universe had stopped and this was my soulmate. And, uh, and we, yeah, we've been connected. He's, you know, I tell him everything and he's my support, my rock, my everything. And I have these sons that are always the loudest at the, you know, in the room and always vibrant and their parents are artists and they grow up, you know, crawling on these floors and, you know, breastfeeding them while choreographing and they've been a part of art and culture and story and this, this form and this history and this place since, you know, since they were born. So, you know, of course they're going to be, you know, big personalities. <laughs> They're definitely not interested in dance whatsoever. You don't see them quite yet no. starting no. As, as apprentices. <laughs> no. Um, you also reconnected with your mother, I think, when you were in your 20s. How did that come about? I, I went and met Gina and I said, well, you know, I'm going to start looking for mum and, you know, I don't know where she is, but, you know. And then finally I found out that she was still in Sojourna, that she was you know, on the, um, out of the community, um, Kuniba. And um, I got a message there saying, okay, well, I'll go, I'll, I'll fly there and, um, and I'll meet mum. And 
and I was so nervous. I was so nervous. I got on the plane and was this little Rex flight. And those flights from Adelaide to Sejuna are horrible because you're it's up and down and there's turbulence and there's ocean and there's great whites and I was like, yeah. oh my God. Anyway, and I arrived and I looked out the window and, and, and still when you arrive, it's just a big fence and like a little kind of, a little shed kind of thing. Was she expecting um, you? She was there. And I was like, how am I going to know, how am I going to know who she is? But you did. I knew yeah. there was a hundred people with their faces pressed against the fence and I came down the stairs. <laughs> I've been so good at like not getting emotional. <laughs> and they, they were watching. Mm. I was walking down the stairs and I looked at this group of people and I saw this little woman and she was just crying and she just had this big smile on her face. <laughs> And I knew straight away. <laughs> and, and I wasn't scared anymore. <sighs> and I think once you realise that it doesn't matter how long, it doesn't matter that you're not there and that you've, you know, you haven't had all this time with your family, that doesn't damage the bond that you have to them, that that's still strong and it's still meaningful and that you're still an important part of, of that kinship system and, um, you know, that you've never been forgotten. Yeah. And I can imagine that um, she would have thought about you all of the time. Oh, absolutely, yeah. 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 Yeah, well, me and Gina, she, we were her babies. Gina's her youngest and, yeah, that was really hard. She, and I love that our old people, they've been through these experiences of shifting government policies and assimilation and child removal and, you know, yeah, the one thing that they can't take from them is their dignity and that sense of dignity that she had that, you know what, I have my grandchildren, I have my family here now, I've got my kids and just this sense of peace and she was happy in her heart. And that's been so inspiring to see a woman like that who could not have suffered more, you know, in her lifetime and yeah. I think you just look at that and you go, wow. Um, it's important to remember that, uh, that my pathway today and where I am today and the position that I'm about to enter into is because of people like her that fought in their own way, that fought by being silent, that fought by being quiet and dignified. And carrying on. And carrying on, being resilient, not speaking language when they're not meant to, but still, you know, holding that place in their heart, holding this sense and this seed of resilience that, you know, they've got to stay strong because they have children, they have grandchildren, and they need to be able to um, ensure that that they are looked after and cared for and they have somewhere to go to, that they have a future, yeah. Francis Rings, thank you for joining me today on One Plus One. Thank you, thanks Rosie.